Hello! Welcome to Archival Adventures. Uh, I think we're all set and ready to go. Um, do let me know if the music is too loud or uh, if I can't be heard. Definitely give me that feedback. Um, there should be captions on both channels. Uh, I think I got everything set up. <laughs> I had to do set up again uh, myself today, but I had instructions this time, so hopefully everything is working. Um, today we're going to be looking at the Hokie Pride collection, the records of Hokie Pride. Uh, Hokie Pride is the oldest LGBTQ plus organization at Virginia Tech, and um, a few years ago they were kind enough to donate their uh, records to us, so we're going to take a look at those. Um, I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Uh, before we uh, get started on looking at materials, a couple of things that I wanted to acknowledge. Um, we acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live, and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. We pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. We also acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. At any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. We pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Further, we acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. We acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. Hi, Hannah. Welcome in. Thank you for being here. Uh, I was running around quite a lot before the start of the stream. Um, I'm not used to having the headphones on and being able to hear what's going on, uh, so... <laughs> Everything's new. Um, anyway, today, like I said, is uh, Hokey Pride. Um, it was also known as the LGBA, the LGBTA, and Lambda Horizon in the past. Um, actually, we should start with the finding aid and get a little history of the organization as we dive in. Um, just have to get the right window up before I switch over. <laughs> all right, you should all be able to see the screen and hopefully still hear me. So do let me know if any of that changed. Um, And Kira, thank you for sharing the link to the finding aid. I had the headphones on backwards, so maybe this will help a little bit. Also, I think the left headphone ear is dead. So, you know, I have some sense of what the music is, but definitely let me know if it uh, seems off or too loud. Um, All right, so here we have the Virginia Heritage site, and I have pulled up the finding aid for Hokie Pride. I'm going to just remove the query from the URL so that we get a clean look at it. And as you can see, this was processed by me. Uh, so I'm actually familiar with these records um, and can probably answer questions about them if they come up while we're looking at stuff. Um, you can see here that the records are covering 1971 to 2015, with the bulk of them being from 1995 to 2013. Um, and we'll just look at the abstract here. Uh, materials from Hokie Pride Student Group, including items from all of its named iterations, Land of Horizons, uh, the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual Alliance, the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Alliance. Um, those were the three other names it went uh, under their officer papers, office records, event planning information, resource pamphlets and directories, and copies of budgetary requests and accounting records. So um, there's some 
very uh, kind of inside baseball things <laughs> uh, in there with like the university student organization budgetary requests and stuff like that. But um, there's also some really interesting content with regard to just LGBTQ history. Um, hmm. I thought I had this set for no, no words. One second. There. Now it's properly set to have no words. Uh, let me go back to the screen share here. Um, so as you can see, it's arranged into four groupings, officer papers, office and resource center records, uh, resources, and finances. Um, uh, yeah, Windows, let's wait an hour on restarting. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I don't want the computer that I'm using to run the stream to restart. And it was like, it's time to restart. Um, there were a couple of items that were in the collection that were removed and put into our rare books collection. Uh, and then there's the listing of what's in each folder. So. Um, if there's anything that pops out to you that you definitely want to have me take a look at, do let me know. Otherwise, we'll do what we've normally done, and I will pull up some um, sorry, uh, and I will pull up things um, as we come across them. Uh, Pretzel Rocks is being very weird today. Um, my normal settings are apparently no longer set. So it's posting in my, um, in the Rogan 27 chat, which songs are playing, which is not necessarily a problem. It's just not supposed to be doing that. So, <laughs> let's just uh, fix that as well. There we go. All right. Um, I say let's let's get started and pull out some material and start taking a look. Nice large archival box. <laughs> so the first folder in here is executive board applications. I'm not going to pull that one out. I'm not going to pull out the contact information for officers. Um, but a few of the officer papers are actually pretty interesting. So I'm going to start by pulling those out and we'll flip through some of them. Let me get onto the document view screen so that you can all see things. And hopefully you'll still be able to hear me on this screen. Every, um, every view has a different settings, so hopefully I got them right on all of them. Okay, so these are the president's papers. Um, I don't know the exact date range for these. We have a little envelope in here. It's been a few years since these came in. Um, so it's been a few years since I looked at them. The little envelope just has, has some business cards, campus programs director, some people at Equality Virginia, um, they have contact info on them that I don't know if it's still current or not, so I'm not going to share them on stream. Um, some handwritten notes, uh, RC survey, how was everyone's break, 
logo presentation update, decision for this week's meeting, review schedule for the semester. Without context, it's not really a terribly useful document, but it's part of the president's papers there. Uh, apparently in 2009, Women's Month was called Gender Matters. So we have a um, calendar for the Women's Month events from March 2009. What else do we have in here? The White Ribbon Campaign, apparently also from 2009. An opportunity for Virginia Tech men to take a stand against the small percentage of men who perpetrate violence against their partners, mothers, sisters, friends, and daughters. Bylaws of the Virginia Tech Council of International Student Organizations. So a lot of these would have been, the president represented Hokie Pride on a number of organizations. And so um, Commission on Student Affairs agenda. Let's see. Constitution of the Panhellenic Association of Virginia Tech. Here's something actually directly related to Hokie Pride workings, which is the uh, GAW schedule. Uh, GAW standing for Gay Awareness Week, which is um, an event that was held by Hokie Pride. Um, I don't remember exactly when it started. Um, I think the first Gay Awareness Week, no, I do know when it started. The first Gay Awareness Week was in 1979. Um, and it continued up through, I want to say it was 2008 or 9, and then it became Pride Week. Those notes are on my desk downstairs, so I don't remember. Um, but I had to look into that this summer because uh, that was, somebody had a question about when the name change happened for that. Um, I'm not sure what year this Gay Awareness Week was, but they had uh, Vidur Kapoor on March 30th. March 31st, they had um, an event on Two-Spirit People. April 1st, they had a bake sale. And, okay, so this would have been sometime in the 2000s because they had... Um, marriage ceremony listed, marriage ceremonies listed, and I know they did some protest events in the 2000s uh, that were staged uh, weddings, same-sex weddings. They had an HRC speaker. It says here, open mic, probably not. Uh, so I don't know what happened with that. And then they had a safe zone reception at the end of the week. LGBT Task Force. State issues affecting James Madison University, the UVA, uh, George Mason University. Parents and families of lesbians and gays. Uh, no local chapters is noted here, which there is a chapter in Floyd, Virginia, which is not that far from here, um, but I don't know if it existed back whenever this was. Hey, working with library. <laughs> we, I, we still do quite a bit of work with um, Hokie Pride. In fact, the library's recent game night was co-sponsored by Hokie Pride. Um, we had a virtual uh, board game night. A room booking. Let's see what else is in here, if there's anything particularly interesting. Or we'll move on to the vice president's papers. Um, there are event chairs that are officers, and theirs have a little bit more interesting stuff. Yeah, 
here we've got, um, please join the LGBT caucus Tuesday, February 10 at 7 p.m. at the Lyric Theater to see the fabulous movie Doubt with Meryl Streep, Philip Seymour Hoffman, and Amy Adams. Uh, if anybody remembers when Doubt came out, that might give us a time frame as to what year this possibly was. Um, I think it was, this was definitely during the Obama years. 2008 is when it came out. So probably sometime around then when they had that event. Um, again, we're seeing uh, many of these things, even event flyers, don't actually list the year, which makes it hard to date them. Um, either or, would you rather? Lots of budget board requests. We have whole folders of budget board requests from them, but apparently there are a bunch here in the president's papers as well. What else? What else? Okay, let's... Unsurprisingly, the president's papers have a lot of administrative stuff in them. Um, so if you're actually like researching the running of student organizations and things like that, um, they could be of use for that, but it doesn't make for the most entertaining material. Um, let's see. I'm going to take a quick glance at the vice president's papers and see if there's anything that's not administrative. I know when we get to the events, there will be more. Hmm. This one's kind of interesting. An LGBT literature bibliography. I'll zoom in just a bit here and see what we can see. It notes Jeff Mann on here. Jeff Mann is an author. Um, thank you, Kira. Uh, Jeff Mann is an author and an English professor here at Virginia Tech, um, known for some, what some people would consider risque um, homosexual novels. Um, so I don't know if this bibliography was for his class um, or if he just prepared it, but uh, I think it's interesting to see what was listed in here. Uh, we have Dorothy Allison's Two or Three Things I Know for Sure, uh, Bastard Out of Carolina, Skin, Talking About Sex, Class and Literature, and Trash, James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room, Mary Bernard Barnard's Sappho, A New Translation, uh, Fun Home by Allison Bechtel, all American Girl by Robin Becker, Vintage by Steve Berman, um, Amuse Bouche, Flight of the Flight of Aquavit, Stain of the Berry, Tapas on the Ramblas, all by Anthony Badulka, Ruby Fruit Jungle, Six of One, Sudden Death, and High Hearts by Rita Mae Brown. Hard Men, Boy in the Middle, and Mortal Companion by Patrick Khalifa. Let's see if there's any that, if, if anybody sees any that they are familiar with and wants to share anything, do let me know. Um, interesting that the one noted here by Samuel R. Delaney is The Fall of the Towers and not Dahlgren. Um, Samuel R. Delaney is a gay sci-fi writer who probably is most well known for Dahlgren, um, at least within the, con the like, construct of um, LGBTQ literature. 
so I, I'm interested to see that the fall of the towers is the one listed here. Um, Love, Death, and the Changing of the Seasons by Marilyn Hacker. The Talented Mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith. The Lost Language of Cranes by David Levitt. And then we've got a couple of items listed here by Jeff Mann himself. Bones Washed Without Wine, On the Tongue, Loving Mountains, Loving Men, Edge, and A History of Barbed Wire. Alex Sanchez, Rainbow High, Rainbow Boys, and Rainbow Road. The P-Town Murders by Jeffrey Round. I'm going to guess this is also from the early to mid-90s for that list. Oh, and it looks like we also have a handwritten um, listing. I'm guessing these are the notes they made for actually putting together that bibliography. What else? Some calendars bookings, budget. That was the vice president of the interior. We have the vice president of the exterior, um, which has a lot of event flyers. So we'll take a look at that. So again, most event flyers don't have dates on them, don't have um, years on them. So I can't say for certain when the LGBTA of Virginia Tech um, hosted this Freedom to Marry Day event. It was on February 19th in some year. Um, I believe, so this would have been the event that actually got covered in the Collegiate Times um, where they staged same-sex weddings um, which I want to say was sometime early 2000s, but I don't remember the year exactly. I would have to dig through the Collegiate Times to find out exactly when this event happened. Um, but yeah, so they had a drill field event. So the drill field is a large, um, a large grassy area on campus here. Um, it's kind of somewhat central to main campus. And they staged illegal marriages, uh, same-sex weddings. <laughs> and there's a disclaimer at the very bottom. It's probably too small for you to make out on stream, but it says, disclaimer. Marriages are only illegal in the sense that they are mock and not legally available to same-sex couples. And they even scheduled a snow date of February 26th. So they were, they were set to have this happen. We have an announcement for the first meeting of the LGBTA for whichever year this was made for. Um, but it includes their mission statement. The mission of the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Alliance is to create a welcoming environment at Virginia Tech for all by representing the needs and concerns of sexual minorities and their allies through campus-wide awareness programs, advocacy, support, and educational resources. So I don't know if that is still their mission today. I would have to go and visit their website to find out. Um, oh, here's one with a, a year on it. Their first meeting in 2004 was on September 3rd. Um, come join the fight for equal rights and also for a fun-filled year of films, speakers, entertainment, socials, and events. Straight allies are welcome to attend. Got a couple of small cards here. 
these would be like table cards or things they could have at events for people to take away. Um, so this, this one uh, is a card for their Freedom to Marry Day event. We invite you to attend the mock wedding ceremonies of several couples on campus to see that relationships of all gender combinations deserve equal treatment under the law. Sponsored by the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Alliance of Virginia Tech. Permitting gays and lesbians the right to formalize their relationships in civil marriage would not force any religious institution to recognize or solemnize these civil marriages. Uh, a quote from the Human Rights Campaign that they included on that. So here's one, uh, another one announcing the first general body meeting of the year. Looks like in spring of 2005 they had an officer's retreat and we have an agenda from that. Giving information on what is the organization, uh, what each officer's role is, who the advisors are, how decisions are made, uh, event planning. It looks like an icebreaker toward the end of the agenda, which is interesting. And then brainstorming goals. Freedom to Marry Day was apparently 2004. We have an event schedule here from that event. And give me one second, I need a sip of water. So it looks like they started the day at 8 a.m. and went until 3 p.m.? No, 9 p.m. Um, they had a table in McBride Hall and a table with a tent out on the drill field. Uh, they set up for the mock weddings at 2 p.m. Um, and started them at 3.30 and they went from 3.30 to 4.30. Um, the mock wedding event had a welcome and introduction from Michael Setfin, who is now on the town council here in Blacksburg. Uh, political updates on marriage equality from Chet Jordan. Opening remarks from Reverend Christine Brownlee. Um, a lesbian wedding. Uh, again, these were not legal weddings at the time, so wedding could be put in quotes there, but. Um, between Ann Schumann and Megan Saney, a gay wedding, between Chase Flynn and Trey Church, a bisexual wedding between Heather Black and Curtis Don, and a transgender wedding between Casey Donegan and Matt Post. And then they had some time to take it down, and then they had their executive meeting and the regular weekly organization meeting. Woo. Sorry. I didn't mean to knock the camera like that. What? This, everything in here was paper clipped together with this schedule. Oh, we have um, we have a copy of the opening remarks. How about I read them? So again, this would have been two thousand four. Uh, so. Almost 20 years ago, let's see, that would have been 17 years ago. Me trying to do mental math, even with dates, doesn't always work out. So I'm going to, I'll read this out and we'll, we'll see how it reads. Hello everyone and welcome to Freedom to Marry Day at Virginia Tech. 
I am Michael Sutphin, the LGBTA's office manager and organizer for this event. Just as a brief introduction, Freedom to Marry Day began nationally in 1998 by Lambda Legal and a coalition of other LGBT activist groups. The idea was to encourage local communities and organizations for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people to raise visibility and share their opinions on the freedom to marry. On a more local level, the LGBTA began celebrating Freedom to Marry Day several years ago, and over those years, we have collected over 900 signatures for the marriage resolution, a single-sentence petition in favor of marriage equality. But a great deal has changed. In the past year, the summer's Supreme Court decision to, take, to strike down bigoted sodomy laws in favor of privacy rights and fairness for LGBT couples has sparked a backlash. Political figures from both parties have given harsh public statements about same-sex marriage. In October of last year, President Bush tested support for anti-gay sentiment by instituting Marriage Protection Week, and many of us were at the campus protest for that. Moreover, a few weeks ago in his State of the Union address, the President suggested to Congress that he would support amending the U.S. Constitution in such a way that would permanently deny marriages and civil unions, not to mention other basic rights to LGBT to LGBT people. Clearly, the struggle against marriage inequality has come into the national spotlight, and we are here today to deal with the issues relating to it in a local context. In order to do that, the LGBTA decided to make two important changes. The first was to promote the millionformarriage.org petition, sponsored by the Human Rights Campaign, and you are all here today for the second. The series of mock weddings, which will shortly follow, are a statement against the inequality of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender individuals. The most important thing to remember when you leave is that the purpose of this event is not to mock the tradition of marriage. Why would the LGBT community mock the institution of marriage when we are in fact trying to gain acceptance into it? The purpose of Freedom to Marry Day is to take on the issue of same-sex marriage with full force. I personally think that this is one of the most interesting issues to talk about because it deals with religion, politics, and sexuality, all subjects we were taught not to bring up in polite conversation. Now I'm going to turn everything over to Chet Jordan, the LGBTA speaker's chair, so that he can talk about the current political struggle against marriage inequality. That's a good introduction. It gives some history, it talks about the purposes of the event, it talks about um, the struggle and, and what it meant. Um, and of course, this happening in 2004, um, it was another 12 years before the Supreme Court ruling in Obergefell uh, made uh, same-sex marriage legal nationwide in 2016. Um, let's see if I can get this here. So here's text of what the um, the minister who was involved in the event uh, read for the mock marriages. As an ordained minister in the Unitarian Universalist tradition, I am pledged to affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. I believe that the love that strong I believe that the love that's strong enough to build a responsible and committed relationship is a love that deserves to be celebrated and respected, whether that love is between a man and a woman, two men or two women, if it involves someone who is attracted to either gender or a person who has chosen to live as a man or a woman because their body and their sense of self-worth are not in harmony. We're not in harmony. I believe that such love is sacred, a gift of God, and an expression of God's love for humankind, and in that belief I am honored to be a part of this occasion. A and B have come before us to represent uh, whichever group you're standing up for, even though these people are citizens and make the same claims of mutual love and lifelong commitment to one another, they are not given the same rights to marry as heterosexual couples. You stand before me now on behalf of those men and women who are denied the right to marry, to speak of your hope for justice and equality for all couples who desire to craft a family due to the same rights and protections, do the same rights and protections of all other families. Are you ready to speak your vows on behalf of all those who cannot speak for themselves? Now you will exchange tokens to represent your hope that the day will come when all people are treated equally in the eyes of the law in matters of family and marriage. I ask you to keep these tokens as a visible sign of your inward commitment to work for that day of justice and joy. After all four couples have spoken, 
Uh, may all who have shared this time with us be blessed by gifts of love. May each of you who have spoken today mark this occasion as a celebration and a source of hope. May you know that you too are loved by, the source of lo by that source of love and goodness and justice that is the foundation of our faith and courage in the days to come as we continue to strive for equ equity in marriage for all. Interesting. There are copies of some of the vows, which are more speeches on the status of marriage equality at the time. And then some copies of the flyers that we already saw. So that's actually a pretty good um, collection of materials about the Freedom to Marry Day event that they had in 2004. Well, that was the vice president of the Exteriors Papers. Most of this material came from a file cabinet in the Hokie Pride office. Um, when the school set up the um, LGBTQ plus uh, community center, um, they basically took away Hokie Pride's office um, and kind of gave that space over to the center. Um, and so LGB, or Hokie Pride didn't have any space to store this stuff anymore. And the officers at the time honestly didn't know what was in there anyway, um, because they had never like, had to deal with these materials. Um, with student organizations, that's not unusual. Uh, leadership changes over time, and um, so it's, it's easy for papers to accumulate that nobody even knows what they are. Um, and so we took them and I looked through them and described what was there and that's how we ended up with this stuff. Um, so this folder is the Gay Awareness Week Chairs Papers. Um, we have a number of flyers for Gay Awareness Week itself where we can see some of the events that they've done uh, or that they did in the past. So the first one here is from Gay Awareness Week in 2000, where they played a movie titled All Over Me, which is one that I am not familiar with, a coming of age story about the changing friendship between two, two teenage girls as they deal with their respective sexuality issues, uh, featuring Wilson Cruz from My So-Called Life. Um, who you may know now from uh, Star Trek Discovery. A discussion on sexuality and religion with several local campus ministers and scholars in the field of religion. A panel, G GLBT issues in the media. Speaker Shane Windmeyer co-editor of Out on Fraternity Row, talking about being gay in a college fraternity. They had comedian Jason Stewart, who I'm not familiar with, but was apparently one of the most well-known gay male comedians of 2000. Featured on Charmed and the Drew Carey Show. He was in Kindergarten Cop and Vegas Vacation. Huh, I don't know who he is. Uh, they had the movie Boys Don't Cry, which um, people would look at today and say, and it's come up in some of the Safe Zone trainings that I've led, um, Boys Don't Cry, people look at it and say that it's not 
a good movie for representation, but at the time, it was groundbreaking. So that would have been an exciting event in 2000. Um, the next year, they started off with Kiss Me Guido. And then the next day they had uh, speakers Thomas McClure and Jeffrey Olson talking about uh, GLBT health issues. They had Shane Windmeyer back again. Apparently he was either a good speaker or possibly had a connection to Virginia Tech if he's uh, there two, two years in a row. I don't know. Uh, then they had Taylor Albright talking about estate planning, which, honestly, that is good programming. For the LGBT community, especially, um, talking about planning for the future and for aging is a topic that doesn't often get discussed within that context. So that's, um, that's good. And, and... Here, they were speak, speaking specifically on issues unique to non-married couples, covering uh, things like wills, power of attorney, health care power of attorney, and advanced medical directives, which at the time before uh, same-sex marriage was legal, um, was a big deal within the community, and honestly should still be a big deal, because nobody should have to get married to be able to have... Uh, a will or a power of attorney to uh, give health care access to their life partner. Like, marriage shouldn't be required for that, so. Um, then they had Ricky Wilkins to talk about gender civil rights. Executor, executive event. Ooh, let's try that word again. Hi, Beth! <laughs> Yes, there, um, indeed, Beth, there were some people who, because of the legalities involved, um, one partner would adopt the other legally, because that was legal and marriage wasn't. <laughs> um, Ricky Wilkins, the d executive director of Gender PAC, the national advocacy organization working to ensure every American's right to their gender, free from stereotypes, discrimination, and violence, regardless of how they look, act, or dress, or how others perceive their sex or sexual orientation. I was not familiar with that organization, but that uh, sounds like a good mission. And then they had a discussion on safe zones. Uh, the next one here is 2003. I don't know if we have a 2002 anywhere. Because, um, again, these weren't, like, systematically gathered. These were, hey, this stuff is in our file cabinet, and they handed it over. And so we just have what they gave us, which is a wealth of information that was not available to the public previously. Um, so 2003, they had a welcome event in the rec center. And then they did um, the movie Boys Don't Cry Again. So two years later, they watched that movie again. Um, again, this was early 2000s. So Boys Don't Cry was definitely a, a popular movie at the time. Uh, then they had uh, Judy Shepard come and speak. So um, she came to talk on the legacy of Matthew Shepard. If you aren't familiar um, with Matthew Shepard, um, I want to say it was 98. It doesn't say on here, and I can't remember exactly. It would have been like 98, 99 time frame. Um, I'm not going to go into details about what happened, but he was uh, the victim of a hate crime and he died. And uh, if you want to learn about 
what happened with Matthew Shepard. There are a lot of resources out there to find that out. Just fair warning, um, some of the descriptions that you'll find are very graphic. Uh, some of the photos that you might come across are very graphic. Um, it was horrific. Um, there is a play about it uh, called The Laramie Project um, that is well worth watching if you're at all interested in the topic. It uh, So the events around that took place in Laramie, Wyoming, and um, a theater group went and interviewed people in town, and the play is made up of quotes from the interviews, and um, it's very impactful. Uh, so if you're at all interested and you feel that it could, would be safe for you to encounter content um, that sort of documents a hate crime, um, I would encourage you to go and watch it. Um, and then they had another discussion on safe zones that year. So these, um, Gay Awareness Week, as founded in 79 and continuing on even into the 2000s, was intended as an educational week. Uh, originally in 79, it was basically to tell people, hey, yes, there are, uh, at, in 79, it was there are gay and lesbian people here at Virginia Tech, and here's, here's what that means. Here's who gay and lesbian people are. And it was about raising awareness that, yes, even here in rural southwest Virginia, um, these people exist. Um, and so as it continued forward, they incorporated other aspects of the community, um, adding in uh, transgender to the mission, bisexual to the mission. Um, today it includes asexual uh, and intersex and two-spirit and um, basically all of the different kind of groups that we come across within the umbrella at this point. Um, and now today it's Pride Week and not Gay Awareness Week, but um, it was an event that had a mission, which is why they had an officer position focused entirely on this. This was the main event that ate up their budgetary requests to the Student Organizations Council and the university. Um, it involved bringing in speakers from, like big name speakers from entertainment to talk on issues. Um, bringing in people to just talk generally on issues of importance to the community. Um, so kind of a big deal that a lot of work went into for a long time. Uh, this one doesn't tell me what year it is, so I'm not 100% sure when this is from, but roughly the same like early 2000s time period. We have a movie, Trembling Before God, learn and discuss orthodox Jewish reaction to homosexuality. Uh, and then they had free bowling at the bowling alley in the student center. Uh, keynote speaker that whatever year this was, was Danny from MTV's Real World. Um, so yeah, very early 2000s that. Uh, talk about gay issues with former cast member from the New Orleans episodes. And here in this year, um, which is probably right around 2004, they have a Wear Jeans If You Support Gay Equality Day. So in 1979, in the first Gay Awareness Week, uh, was, the, was uh, an event called Denim Day that if you watched um, at the beginning of April, Actually, it might have been mid-April. I don't remember exactly when we got to it, but we did look at oral histories from the people who organized the first Gay Awareness Week um, that included that very first Denim Day. Um, I am unclear as to whether the people organizing Gay Awareness Week in the mid-2000s were even aware that Denim Day had happened in 1979, but here is Denim Day, just with a different name. Um, and then when we did commemorative events for the 40th anniversary of Denim Day in 2019, we were not aware that this one had happened. Uh, so it's really easy for this history to get lost uh, for a variety of reasons. 
um, some of those reasons involving, uh, especially in the early days, the danger of being known as part of the LGBT community. Um, yeah, it was... I don't remember if it was the very beginning of April or if it was mid-April. I know it was April because April I focused on, uh, I tried to focus as much as possible on LGBT content because April is um, when Pride is celebrated here at Virginia Tech. Uh, since the traditional Pride month of June, um, there are no students on campus. Um, they ended that one with a showcase of gay plays. We've got a, a flyer here for the Wear Jeans If You Support Gay Equality Day. Uh, which is back to being called um, Denim Day again. And yeah, I do believe these are from 2004. Yes, so this card here actually includes the year um, 2004. Wait an hour, please. I do not want to restart the computer in the middle of my stream. Thank you, Windows. <laughs> uh, they have the bowling flyer, a full page flyer for the, the denim day. Oh, and then we have, uh, we jumped to 2006. So these are information rich and I'm very, very, very excited by the fact that most of them include the year because that is very important. Um, historical information. Uh, tying the Knot, a documentary looking at the deba debate over same-sex marriage. What's morally wrong with homosexuality? Is homosexuality unnatural? Is it harmful to society? Is it biologically determined and does that matter? In this presentation, Dr. John Corvino will address these questions and more. Um, Based on the fact that this was part of Gay Awareness Week, I'm guessing uh, that we can predict what his answers were to those questions. That it is not unnatural, not harmful to society. Um, whether or not it's biologically determined, I'm not sure I could predict what his answer would be. But does it matter? Um, Mid-2000s, I don't know what his answer would have been to that question. And then they have a, an event called the State of the Union, uh, debating gay marriage. Um, and then we have one here. I don't know what year this is from. I believe these are in chronological order, though, so it's probably around 2007, 2008. Um, stripped and Tease. Come see Kimberly Dark's intriguing theatrical performance and learn things you never knew about sexual and gender identity. The Down Low. E. Lynn Harris wrote a foreword in the book. The Down Low, and also discussed this idea in his novel, I Say a Little Prayer. Hear him speak about his life, experiences, and other award-winning novels. Guess Who's Gay? Ask a panel of your colleagues anything you want to know. At the end of the night, guess who's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or straight? The participant who guesses the most correctly wins a prize bag. Homosexuality and morality or homosexuality, morality, and diversity. Dr. John Corvino visits us to have a discussion on issues such as homosexuality and religion, homosexuality and race, etc. So this is actually probably still 2006. Uh, and then the Safe Zone Anniversary. Join us in the culmination of Gay Awareness Week by attending the 10th anniversary of uh, the 10th anniversary Safe Zone Reception. So if this was indeed 2006, that would put the start of Safe Zone at Virginia Tech in 96, which I think sounds right. Uh, flyer for the real world event. Flyer for the when Judy Shepard came to speak.
there's a a decent summary on this flyer that is probably okay for generalized consumption. In October 1998, Judy Shepard lost her 21-year-old son Matthew to a murder motivated by anti-gay hate. Turning her family's tragedy into a crusade for justice, she inspires millions to rally for hate crimes legislation in her son's honor. Determined to prevent Matthew's fate from befalling others, Judy and her husband Dennis established the, Mash the Matthew Shepard Foundation to help carry on Matthew's legacy by embracing the causes he had championed. She has testified before the Senate in the support of the Hate Crimes Prevention Act and has become an outspoken advocate. So that gives a, a good description as to why she was brought in to be a speaker. So this is the, um, a flyer for this Shane Windmeyer person who spoke on um, fraternities and gay people. Uh, and they had him here twice, and I just, I'm not familiar with him. But apparently he was a decent enough speaker that they had him twice. Here's a flyer for the Boy Scouts, Gay Rights, and the Supreme Court, uh, featuring James Dale, gay Eagle Scout who was barred from the Boy Scouts because of his sexual orientation, a decision that was supported by the U.S. Supreme Court. Dale speaks passionately about the gay civil rights movement and the continuing controversy surrounding the his this historic discrimination case. So one thing that you may note about these materials is, um, well, something that I often point out when I use them um, in teaching for the um, LGBTQ plus issues class. Um, they're almost universally focused on the white gay cis men's perspective. Most of the speakers focus on that uh, demographic. Most of the events cater to that demographic primarily. And honestly, given that these are mostly from the late 90s, early 2000s, that's not terribly surprising. That was the primary um, demographic that was seen as the gay rights movement during that time period. Um, that doesn't mean that that was right. It just means that that was the group that was out there shouting and screaming to be seen at the time um, and getting the attention. That's when TV shows started to include um, more sympathetic gay characters. Uh, shows like Will and Grace came along. Um, there were uh, Queer as Folk was on the, on the air. Um, and so it's, it's not terribly surprising that that's the demographic that gets, that shows up most in these documents. Um, because every layer of marginalization that you add to identity, the harder it is to f get documentation about that group and um, be able to include it in a collection like this. Uh, and even today, Hokie Pride as an organization tends to be primarily white, primarily cis. Um, and there are other organizations that have grown up on campus. Um, there's uh, QT POC, which is Queer and Trans People of Color. Um, there's Trans Space. Um, there's a group called Space, S-P-A-A-C-E, uh, which is focused specifically on asexual people. Um, and so they've grown up because they didn't feel like they necessarily belonged in Hokie Pride. Um, so we would, we would welcome um, materials from any of those group, groups if they wanted to share them. Um, but as of this time, the group we have materials from is Hokie Pride. Yeah. 
let's move on to the next folder. And again, if anybody has found anything in the finding aid that you're interested in, in particular in seeing, let me know, and I will be happy to pull it out um, and share it. So this folder is the AIDS Awareness Week chairs papers. So the last one was Gay Awareness Week. Um, they also had a regular event called AIDS Awareness Week. I don't know when it started. Um, and I don't know how much documentation around AIDS Awareness Week is actually in here. Um, most of this is some administrative paperwork. There's some stuff in here, though, for Club Red Ribbon. Um, and they sponsored uh, the Red Ribbon Ride. Um, and so if you're not aware, December 1st is World AIDS Day, and um, the red ribbon is worn uh, to show support for the fight against AIDS. So it looks like whatever year this was, they had a special guest DJ uh, drag show as part of their Club Red Ribbon event. Proceeds benefiting the AIDS Council of Western Virginia. So not a ton of material in the AIDS Awareness Chairs papers. I think there's more stuff in here um, later on, on like the Red Ribbon Ride and stuff like that. Webmasters papers, we'll skip that one. Film chair. Let's see. Some booking paperwork for actually arranging film screenings. But we also have some flyers. And the flyers are kind of interesting to look at. Here we go. Virginia Tech's second annual Jewish Film Festival in 2006. Try to zoom in. The Jewish Film Festival and the LGBTA at Virginia Tech have teamed up to bring the internationally acclaimed Israeli movie Yossi and Yeager by renowned director Eitan Fox. This movie is based on the true story of a gay couple serving in the Israeli army. The film chronicles their struggle with their sexual identity while also dealing with outside forces such as enemy attacks and life stationed in a military outpost. The fact that is Israel... The, oh, I think that's supposed to say the fact that Israelis allow openly gay officers to serve in the military complicates the choice the two men must make. This wonderful film captures the dichotomous lives of Israelis, which are constantly marked by both joy and laughter, heartache and tragedy. Uh, it had multiple sponsors, Hillel at Virginia Tech, Malcolm and Diane Rosenberg Program in Judaic Studies, LGBTA, Grala Family Philanthropic Fund, Blacksburg Jewish Community Center, and the John E. Merrick Holocaust Education Fund of the Community Foundation of the New River Valley. got a couple of copies of that flyer. Um, this one here is a screening of Imagine Me and You, which is a film I'm not familiar with. Uh, Heck and Rachel are a happy young couple about to embark on life's journey together, but at the church, Rachel catches the eye of an unexpected guest. 
In that moment, Rachel realizes that maybe Heck is not the one for her. What follows is the romantic, humorous, and sometimes, sometimes poignant story familiar to anyone who has ever been lucky or unlucky enough to be under love's spell. A couple of copies of that in here. Oh, in multiple colors. So this is um, documentation of the kind of requests that they had to submit for a film screening. Uh, this one is for All Over the Guy. Um, so there's not a lot of information on it, but they're renting a space for it, and it has information about like setup instructions, they needed some tables in the hallway. Um, so it doesn't look like they were charged anything for it, which is interesting. Production services. And here we have the flyer for that movie, All Over the Guy. When an unlikely pair of individuals are thrown together by their respective matchmaking best friends, trouble is quick to ensue. Opposites attract in this charming tale as a new couple stumbles over their own fears, family dysfunctions, and foolish bouts of self-sabotage. This contemporary romantic comedy perfectly captures the fierce peculiarities and confusion about the universal quest for that one true love. Imagine Me and You is a good movie. I haven't seen it, Beth, but I'm um, glad to hear that it is good. Let's see. What's next? Um, this one is for a movie called Chutney Popcorn. Rena and Lisa are young, happy, and in love, but when Rena agrees to become a surrogate mother for her childless sister, the cultural divide between Rena's Indian family and their lesbian lifestyle hits home. So I don't know when these screenings were happening, but um, it's nice to see a little bit uh, more diversity. Imagine Me and You is one of your top five lesbian movies. Well, that is um, good information. So if anybody has not seen it and is interested in a good lesbian movie, <clears throat> Imagine Me and You. Let's see. Some communications about doing chutney popcorn. There's some administrative stuff in here about um, arranging for film screenings, which can be interesting, because uh, you have to have licensing to be able to show stuff um, live to an audience. Uh, here they have rent. So, I don't know when they showed this, but I've seen this recording of Rent, and it is a good one. And here we have um, a flyer, not related to the film screenings, but uh, a closed Alcoholics Anonymous meeting intended for the GLBT community. So we do have an organization here on campus, um, the Recovery Community at Virginia Tech, um, and they do have special meetings that they have uh, that are targeted specifically for the LGBT community as well. Um, so interesting to see that show up in here, um, knowing that there were targeted meetings sometime in the 90s and 2000s. Um, Again, another item that wasn't dated, so I don't know exactly when it was from, but generally that time frame. Let's see, what else do we have? 
leadership retreat, programming handbook, student affairs, flyers, photographs, resource center, political action petitions, I will sh talk about one of these folders, but I probably won't read it out and share exclusively, but I think it's interesting to talk about. Oh, that one's a good one. I'm just going to pull out a bunch of folders here, and we will take a look at them. Uh, ooh, student Organization Showcase, Days, Club Red Ribbon, Safe Zones, Event Flyers. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that'll work too. Okay. <laughs> This one's kind of easier uh, because I did the processing on this, so I know what's in most of the folders. Um, so it's a little bit easier for me to navigate and pull out things that could be kind of interesting to look at. Uh, I know the officer papers that I went through weren't especially interesting all the way through, but um, there was some interesting stuff in there. Ah, okay. So these are going to be photographs, and this is specifically, um, this was part of a campaign that they did. I don't know the specifics of it. I know we have a lot of these tiny little photos. They're not actually on photo paper. They're on just like glossy printer paper. Um, but basically they had a dry erase board and people could write a message on it and they photographed them and they're printed in rainbow colors. So I don't know 100% what it was used for. I know it was an event on the drill field because the photos were taken on the drill field. Um, but it was like a community outreach event of some sort. Um, I think it was like asking people to, like the prompt was proud to be, and then they could put in the message that they wanted to share. Um, so up here we have proud to be hella gay, proud to be gay, proud to be open-minded, Proud to be a supporter of happiness. Uh, proud to be an American airman. Proud to be pro-choice. Proud to be young Dems. Proud to be Chicano. Proud to be a gender fluid hokey. Proud to be open-minded. Uh, I can't pick them up. Um, but there's like a whole stack of these here. Um, oh, it's Victoria. Proud to be Latina. <laughs> I don't know, it's Veronica. I don't know exactly when Veronica started here. Veronica, um, in this red photo here, um, Veronica Montes is the head of El Centro. Uh, she's the director for El Centro, which is the, um, Latin, uh, the Latinx community center here at Virginia Tech. Um, I think she started here a year before me. So this must have been late 2000s, sometime around like 2014, uh, when this, when those photos, when that photo campaign happened. Um, oh, and we have a photo from the same event, but without the coloration. So just a standard photo there. Uh, proud to be a queer hokey. 
we have a couple of photos here. Let's see, this one is from the Freedom to Marry Day event in 2001. Uh, so there's the uni Unitarian Universalist um, minister who performed the ceremony, as well as the uh, four different couples that got married. I don't know. I think it's these two, those two, those two, and those two. This is Michael Sutton here in the front. He is the one who did the introduction for the event. Um, he is now, uh, like I mentioned earlier, a town councilman here in Blacksburg. Um, we have uh, a picture of the LGBTA in 2006-2007. Again, LGBTA was the third name that this organization had. Today it's called Hokie Pride. It was originally Lambda Horizon, and then the LGBA, and then LGBTA, um, and now Hokie Pride. I believe LGBTA was the name that it had for the longest. Another membership image. And then I have like a, a black and white picture here from um, sometime after the name change. So this would have been uh, like mid 2010s because I believe the name changed in 2000 or in like the late 2000s or early 2010s. I don't remember the exact date of the chain, name change at the moment. Um, and then they have a, a photo here from Freedom to Marry Day in 2010, uh, where they again had mock marriages happen. Uh, an event from 2009 called Pillow Talk with Sean Decker and Gwen Berenger from AIDS Awareness Week. The Guess Who's Gay at Queer 101 event in 2009. And then there's a photo here just of a bunch of American flags labeled Voices of Honor Tour Display, April 27, 2010. I don't know anything more about that event. Um, but it was apparently something relevant to Hokie Pride. So if somebody was researching LGBTQ history here, they could try and find out more about that event. Um, Resource Center, Political Action Petitions. So I'll talk about this folder. I don't know how much I'm actually going to share from the contents inside. Um, the folder is labeled Correspondence Hate Documentation. Um, I'll read a little bit here. I just have to scan it first before I put it on stream. All right. Um, so I'll just give a warning here. There is going to be, I'm going to read a little bit of this language. I, I have to cover up part of this because there are pictures of naked women. Um, so here we have an email from a person who doesn't even hide their identity, um, a student at Virginia Tech, who said, uh, this was sent in 95, uh, we believe in gay rights, their right to be shot, their right to be castrated, their right to die a slow, painful death. Um, and then it goes on in similar vein. Um, and at the end says, uh, the attached pictures show you what a real man looks at um, UPOS, and 
then there are very small, very grainy images of um, mostly nude women. Um, and so what we have here is actual documentation of how it was responded to. So let me find. So that original was sent in on September 17th of 95. And we have a response from Virginia Tech. Um, so we have Lanny. Uh, what follows is the response I sent this afternoon to the Out and Proud homepage. I have copied this to everyone on campus who has been involved in resolving this issue or who has asked me about it so that everyone will know our official response. This response was vetted by Bill Sa Sanders and Larry Hinkner in addition to you before it was sent. Uh, Kay Heidbretter was in court, so I couldn't discuss it with her. Hope it suffices. Um, so the response here, thank you for bringing to our attention the fact that an offensive and threatening message was sent from a Virginia Tech computer account. You are correct that this communication violates our acceptable use policy. Virginia Tech does not condone this type of message, nor do we condone the misuse of our computer system. We regret that our system was used to send such an inappropriate message, and we have taken steps to hold accountable the individuals who sent it. Yesterday, I met with the student whose computer was used to send the original message. As you are aware, he denies having sent it. We have turned this case over to the Virginia Tech Police Department for investigation. Staff members at our computing center are assisting the police to collect the information needed to resolve this matter. Based on that investigation, my office will pursue judicial action against students referred to us by the police. Um, and then we have, uh, let's see, the Virginia Tech Police Department, assisted by the University Computing Center, has today identified the student who we believe sent the threatening and offensive message to Out and Proud, University... Judicial charges are being prepared, and we expect to have the case concluded by sometime next week. We will, of course, not be able to release the name of the individual charged in this case, since it would be a violation of federal law and university policy to do so. However, we will inform you and your readers of the outcome of the case. I am grateful to the university or to the Virginia Tech Police Department and the University Computing Center for their assistance in concluding this investigation so quickly. Um, So it's, it's very interesting to me that we have like this documentation, not just of the actual like incident and the actual hate, hateful message that was sent, but also the university's response to it. Um, which honestly, while it feels kind of inadequate, makes sense from the perspective of university administration, what they're able to do, um, how they're able to investigate things, etc. It, it falls within the authority that they have to investigate any sort of bias-related incidents. Um, so while it is likely inadequate, it also uh, falls within standard procedure. Um, the student who sent the offensive and threatening message to Out and Proud was charged under Virginia Tech's student judicial system and has accepted responsibility for this violation of our policies. While it is not ordinarily our practice to release information about sanctions imposed in a university judicial cases, uh, this is the first case of a student violation of our acceptable, our, our acceptable use policy and we believe it is in the university's interest to inform our students and the public of the general nature of the sanctions for such a violation. So. They chose to release a statement because this happened to be the first time somebody had used the university's computing system, uh, the university's email system, to do something like this. Um, so this was really early on in like the, when the university was making a, an email available to students. Um, again, this was 1995. 
In this case, in addition to normal judicial sanctions, the student has been deprived of full access to the university computing system for a period of time. This student will be provided with a monitored account for use in academic coursework only, and will be able to regain unrestricted use of our computing system only, um, only after demonstrating appropriate and restricted use on this monitored account for several months. In addition, this student will write a report explaining the acceptable use policy and the consequences for violating it. The report will be shared with the student body as part of our effort to educate them about the policy. In addition to these imposed sanctions, this student has voluntarily offered to write a letter of apology to readers of Out and Proud. Because computer access is now restricted, the message will be sent to you from my computer account. The purpose of a university judicial system is to educate students about appropriate behavior and community responsibility. After meeting with this student at length, I am convinced that this has indeed been an educational experience. The student is truly remorseful about sending the offensive and threatening message to Out and Proud. I trust that your readers, who were justifiably upset and hurt by the message, will be similarly genuine in their acceptance of the learning which has occurred in the last two weeks. I am thankful to readers of Out and Proud who communicated their concern to me and to other administrators at Virginia Tech in a positive and respectful manner, despite the volatile emotions which surrounded this incident. Their expressed confidence that Virginia Tech would handle this honestly and appropriately was encouraging for us. So, their resolution there and the sanctions that were imposed seem reasonable. It, it follows somewhat of a restorative justice model. The only problem is the wronged party was not involved in determining what the sanctions would be, which would be a hallmark of a restorative, restorative justice system. Um, so it also comes across as not exactly appropriate. Um, And there's an, another letter in here about another hate incident that happened. Um, but again, just even having documentation of something like that is super, super rare. Um, like the full on documentation of the actual offensive item and the response to it. Um, really rather rare there. Um, Let's see, this one is thank you notes, awards, and autographs. So something a bit happier. Uh, so there's a, a card here. Uh, it's got some hibiscus on the front. Reggie, thanks once again for bringing me and hate speech and love songs to Virginia Tech. Truly appreciate your efforts. Enclosed as a small gift of thanks, please let me know if you have any feedback or suggestions for improvement. Also, if you know of any other schools who might be interested. I'd appreciate it. Uh, best regards, Tom... McConnell? McCorm I'm not sure the signature. But if you look up hate speech and love songs, uh, you'll probably find out the full name there. <laughs> we might also find it if we come across anything else related to it in the materials. Um, an autographed photo here. To LGBT of Virginia Tech, I had a blast, really, uh, signed by Scott Kennedy in 2003, it appears. U.S. Comedy Arts Festival on his hat. I'm not familiar with this artist, uh, but apparently a comedian of some sort. We have a signed flyer from LGBTA present, a VT presents Ryan Salins uh, 
the signature is here. It says, honor your truths. Uh, Ryan Salins, author and transgender activist. Um, here we have a letter from Clarice Evans to the LGBTA regarding human sexuality panels. Well, finals are over and most of the undergraduates have either graduated or gone home for the summer. Now that I have finished doing grades, I wanted to take a few minutes to thank all of you who have been involved in doing panels over the past two years for the human sexuality course that I have taught. I have appreciated your, cur the, I have appreciated your courage. It takes guts to get up in front of a class and present in general, and even more courage to be open about one's sexual orientation and experiences with it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I will no longer be teaching the course in the fall and wanted to give you contact information for the new instructor so that her name will be at least familiar to you should she contact you to speak in the future. Her name is Karen Jost. Thank you again for your support over the last two years. Know that you have made a difference in the sexual education of over 800 undergraduates. And this one, a lot of thank yous here. I'm not sure. Oh, I think this goes with the letter about um, the panels. So just a lot of thank yous all over that page there. So if you're at all familiar with the concept of Safe Zone, uh, Safe Zone essentially is a training for people on LGBTQ topics. Um, many people don't receive any education on those topics when they're in school. Um, and so they get to college and people are struggling with identity and they need support. Um, and so the Safe Zone program, at least here at Virginia Tech, and, and honestly, I think more broadly, um, is focused on educating people to be resources and supports for people that are struggling with identity. Um, and, and a lot of people want to be that resource, but know nothing about the topic themselves. So that's why Safe Zone exists. Um, I'm going to take another sip of water here. So, some handwritten notes from October 5th, 2000. Um, but the real interesting piece in here is this Safe Zones of Virginia Tech resource manual. Um, We'll dive into the manual in a second. First, I, I just wanted to show it off. But first, before we go into it, um, there's a little background information that we can look at in here. Procedures for Safe Zone Program at Virginia Tech. Safe Zone Program was established in 1998 as a way to recognize individuals, places, and organizations that provide a supportive environment for the gay community. The annual recognition of Safe Zones will be held on the first Friday of February. Existing Safe Zone individuals will be sent a letter annually by the Dean 
the Dean of Students Office and LGBTA thanking them for agreeing to be recognized as a safe zone and refreshing them on what it means to be a safe zone. Uh, nominations will be solicited from current individuals designated as safe zones and members of LGBTA and the Gay Caucus. Nominations will include a one to two paragraph explanation for the nomination. Places and organizations will be recertified annually by LGBTA and the Gay Caucus. A letter will be sent to such places explaining what it means to be a safe zone and requesting that they indicate if they still want to be classified as such. All nominations must be submitted to the LGBTA office. The approved list of individuals and places to be recognized will be provided to the Dean of Students office and they'll notify those nominated for recognition and host the reception. Um, so really the important thing there is it was established in 1998 and was a voluntary program for people who wanted to be identified as um, a safe zone for LGBT uh, students. They had places named as comfort zones, and many of these places are just, th this is like campus facilities, so Dietz Place is one of the um, cafeterias on campus, uh, Owens Hall, the Methodist Campus Center, Society of Women Engineers, Phi Beta, Pi Beta Phi House, the Women's Center, Women's Rugby, um, which honestly, women's rugby here at Tech was always kind of a, um, an organization that was very welcoming to the lesbian community. Uh, I did not know that until two years ago when we were doing the, the Denim Day history stuff um, and had one of the, uh, one of the oral histories, um, actually possibly more than one of the oral histories, talks about the women's rugby um, and it being a welcoming place, and um, so. But yeah, a number of comfort zones listed there, information sign up. Multiple copies of a application form. Whew. You can tell that's 90s or early 2000s with that neon orange ink. Um, an entire building should never be a safe zone. So the, the whole concept of safe zone here at Virginia Tech was not that an, a building is a safe zone, but that individuals within the building, individual people, individual departments, um, would be identified as safe zones and that they had agreed to be trained and understand uh, LGBT issues and be available as resources. Um, there's stuff about the sessions. Let's see. I love this full glossy page for just that tiny graphic in the center. But it's a great graphic. Safe zone. Feel free to be yourself. Um, then we have little flyers about Virginia Tech's Safe Zone program. Uh, try and zoom in a bit. And I pushed the button for too long. Uh, but we're basically there. Objectives. To identify a network of allies who are concerned, empathetic, and knowledgeable about lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender questions. To provide evidence of the support of LGBTQ people and their allies within the Virginia Tech community by posting a sign as tangible evidence of that support. To reduce the fear of reprisal and discrimination by LGBTQ people and their allies within the Virginia Tech community. To assist LGBTQ and allied students in achieving their educational goals by creating an environment in which they can be themselves. History and Mission Established in 1998, the Safe Zone program was established as a collective, collaborative effort between the Dean of Students, the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Alliance, the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Caucus, and the Office of Equal Opportunity. Now coordinated through the Multicultural Programs and Services, 
The Safe Zone program exists to educate the Virginia Tech community on topics related to the LGBTQ community. Safe Zones are members of the program who are committed to providing a more inclusive and accepting environment for a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning communities and their allies. And so you can see Q at the time uh, was taken to mean questioning. Um, and then somebody who would go through the program would get uh, this placard to put in their window. that would identify them as a safe zone. Zoom out if I can. And then they had uh, a trifold flyer. just kind of informational packet about the program. Where you could learn more about it, what is a safe zone. Uh, we've already read most of that description. Some information on the different courses that were part of the safe zone program. Safe Zone 101, consider this your introduction. Topics addressed in this first training workshop include common terms and definitions related to the LGBTQ identity and experience, the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity, the coming out process, the experience of LGBTQ Hokies, and how you can be an ally to the community. Transgender 101, uh, many people hold common misconceptions about people who identify as transgender, transsexual, genderqueer, or in some unique way with regard to sex slash gender and identity. This session provides an overview of gender diversity and a forum for exploring unfamiliar concepts. Uh, and then a session on New River Valley resources. So Virginia Tech is located within the New River Valley in Virginia. Um, so kind of a, that session provided an overview on resources. Uh, one on LGBT history. In the world today, we hear about people coming out or being outed, the debate about marriage equality, and the politicians that pander to different groups using LGBT rights as a polarizing strategy. But none of this is new. This session will look at the history of the LGBT community, especially in Europe and the US, hitting important moments in the struggle for equal rights. Uh, one on suicide watch and prevention, one on LGBTQ legal, one on compliance uh, that builds on the legal one, and um, a note that additional sessions are being planned. Uh, this, the whole program has changed multiple times since these materials, um, and its current iteration is very different from this, um, but has similar goals. So this uh, Safe Zone resource manual is from the original Safe Zone program in the 90s, the mid 90s. Um, <laughs> Safe Zone overview, 37 fabulous ways to support LGBT students, some common definitions, information about LGBT people, myths and stereotypes, symbols of pride, identity development model, coming out what is heterosexual privilege, homophobia, campus resources, and community resources. So this would most likely have been accompanying the Safe Zone 101 session. Um, so they've got here a list of 37 fabulous ways to support lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered students on your campus. Have a non-discrimination policy that includes sexual orientation, Value their perspectives and opinions in your residence halls, your classrooms, and your committees. Don't tokenize them. Assure their safety. Acknowledge their presence on campus and in society publicly at high levels and often. Attend their events once in a while. Don't agree with everything they say. Challenge them too. 
Help non-gay students to understand that LGBT people are a presence on campus and in society whether they like it or not. Non-gay students do not have to accept their lifestyle, but they must learn to live peaceably with them. Ensure sensitivity training programs for all student affairs staff. Give equal benefits to their partners, assure their safety, value their perspectives and opinions. Know which employers interviewing on your campus have non-discrimination and domestic partner policies. Employers should be required to affirm in writing that they do not discriminate. So it's a, a good list. Uh, some things that would need to be updated for today, obviously. Um, but this was an early, early safe zone program. Um, partly because Virginia Tech had been fairly active in LGBTQ plus activism on campus since 1979. Um, and they definitely had a very active group here in 95, uh, from like 95 through um, like, I'm, I mean, honestly, through today, um, some of the stuff has died off a little bit as organizational changes have happened, but still fairly active. Um, I'm going to switch back to Facecam because we are coming to the end of the stream today. Um, I want to thank everybody who stopped by today and hung out with me while we looked at the Hokie Pride materials. Um, this was originally planned for last week uh, to be the kind of capstone for our Pride Week streams, but uh, we had the change in the schedule with the uh, announcement of Michael Collins' death, and so we had looked at his materials last week instead. Um, so thank you for coming today and joining me to look at Hokie Pride materials today. Uh, coming up next week, we have um, an item that is an interesting book. It's Watercolors of Fungi. Um, it's listed in our collections as a um, as a collection, but it's really just one book. Um, and so I think we can cover the book for the full two hours. If we get bored with it and want to move on to something else, it's in with a bunch of other single folder collections. So we'll have plenty of material that we can look at if we decide we're done looking at uh, fungi. And then for the month of May, I believe uh, my plan right now is to focus mainly on um, kind of horticultural stuff. Uh, it's a good time for gardening, and we have a number of garden club materials. So uh, streams for the rest of this month, we'll start with fungi, and then we'll look at some uh, stuff for the Master Gardener program here at Virginia Tech. We'll look at some community garden clubs and uh, those types of materials for the rest of the month of May, and then uh, we'll see where we go from there. Um, again, I want to say thank you to everybody who stopped by today for Archival Adventures. Uh, whether you are actively in chat, whether you're here all the, all the time, Hannah, yeah, Watercolors of Fungi, um, I got a quick glance at it, um, and I think it looks really, really cool. And Hannah, thank you so much for the 100 bits. Um, I'm going to go ahead and set up a raid for the end of the stream, but if you are at all interested in um, tabletop RPGs, uh, coming up on Friday on the VTUL Studios channel, we will have a one-shot D&D um, 5e session uh, that's being led by Kira, who will be the DM. Um, and it is a sequel to the one-shot that happened um, maybe a month or so ago based on um, Sherlock Holmes. So uh, I believe this one is the mystery of the artifacts or something like that. Um, but yeah, definitely stop on by. Uh, it's twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios. That's for Virginia Tech University Libraries Studios, VTUL Studios, on Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time for a one-shot D&D 5e adventure based on Sherlock Holmes. Um, we are going to raid over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So... Um, Hop in there, have a good time watching um, whichever uh, aquarium-related content that they've got today. Um, they're always a fun, uh, good, kind of chill background stream. 
Um, so have fun over there, and I will see you all um, here on the VTUL Studios channel again next Wednesday or over on my personal channel come Saturday. And again, thanks everybody for stopping by.